my name is Daniel. I uh, am a grizzled system administrator currently at Mozilla. Uh, and I'm North American, which makes me a little different, I think, from the rest of the panel. So there you go. Hi, my name is Fabrice Bernhardt. So I'm the um, CTO and co-founder of Theodo. And I also happen to have, by chance, uh, participated to the uh, founding of the Paris DevOps Meetup in 2010. Hi, I'm Pierre Padrix. I'm a software engineer at Numergy, and I work on the orchestration and the deployment of uh, OpenStack services for Numergy. Hi, I'm Julien Vey. I also work at Numergy with Pierre. I'm an OpenStack developer. I work with uh, OpenStack, of course, with Docker, and uh, we try to bring DevOps in, uh, in uh, Numergy. Okay, second question for, for all of you. Can you tell us um, in, a few, in a few sentences what brought you to DevOps? Why you decided that you should be on a DevOps panel? Actually, I decided that, but why I decided that? <laughs> um, what, what brought you to the world of DevOps? What motivated you to get there? And what, what do you think is important in that? Are we just going to go in order each time or want to switch it up? No? Let's start with you. All right. Uh, what brought me to uh, what brought me to DevOps, I would say, was primarily uh, frustration, irritation. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to sugarcoat it. Uh, being a system administrator, uh, especially in large organizations, uh, is a lot like banging your head against the wall for eight hours a day. And I wanted to stop doing that. And there's a better way. There's a way that involves communication. There's a way that involves teams working together. There's a way that involves agility. There's a way that involves uh, uh, automation. There's a way that involves sharing. Uh, of data, of information, and uh, it just, it's, it's just a way better way to work. It's a way better way to be involved in any sort of a, a technology environment. And that's what brought me to DevOps. I'd say two things. So the, the first thing, interesting thing about me is that I actually started by co-founding a, a startup called Anomatch.com. So it's the websites for uh, finding uh, bars and restaurants to watch uh, sports games in in, in them, like bars and restaurants. So Allomatch.com still exists. I uh, encourage you to uh, visit it. And um, of course, as the CEO of such a startup, I did everything from dev to ops. Uh, ops was a thing I didn't know so much about, but I had kind of you know, to handle uh, anyway. And then when I co-founded Teodo, which is an agile web development shop, um, I saw how people that I didn't have this operations experience at all were acting really differently and in, in ways that weren't uh, that were really uh, non beneficial to the to their code written so this is how uh, and since at the same time I was really interested into agility and we adopted scrum really quickly I thought wow this is we need to find w w who and where are the people that are thinking about agility but not on just on the development process but to the uh, production and that's how DevOps came to me one day, and then, and, and of course, it was like love at first sight. A few years ago, I was in a company that uh, was using agile methodology. And um, the problem behind that is that we didn't have infrastructure as code. We, we used to uh, manually uh, deploy, provision, everything. And uh, we had a big problem with that because uh, as Agile methodology forces us to um, have a very fast uh, sprint. We needed to deploy very fast and it, was, uh, it wasn't compatible with uh, this methodology. So um, it was really frustrating to work with that, uh, like that. So now uh, I, I started to automate it things. It's, down, uh, it's more compliant with uh, our Agile methodology nowadays. So I think I will repeat uh, what you say, but uh, I'm originally a developer and I like to do everything. Uh, so that's the main reason I did DevOps, but I worked in large organizations and like the presentation we had before, it was really frustrating to wait uh, months for to have a server, problems to deploy into production. And that's why I think infrastructure as code is really the main, uh, the main thing that uh, made me do DevOps. I want to code my infrastructure, to code my deployment. I want to have everything as code. So that's uh, that's why when I started at Numergy, we worked on the CI/CD tools, 
and deployment tools, orchestration, and uh, everything to bring all the operational side to the developers. Thank you. So after this, this introduction, um, are there any questions already from the public? Yep, we have one question. Can I ask you to speak in the microphone? Sure. Uh, hello, um, I have a question. You've been talking a lot about Agile, all of you. Uh, is that a requirement? or no? Because in my company, we don't really do Agile on development, but we are um, considering uh, using a lot of things from DevOps, uh, like infrastructure as code, continuous deployment, stuff like that. So is that possible? Is that even worth it? Anyone to answer? First come, first serve. Um, I had a, uh, I was at Velocity New York um, in September, and uh, I had this really interesting lunch with John Cole from Etsy. And uh, Etsy is um, is the company where um, what's his name again? Uh, anyway, a really famous guy who wrote an amazing book called Continuous Deployment is John Ospo exactly is working. And it's really interesting to see how the whole organization has um, has this feeling of agility because they're really fast, they're deploying 30 times a day, but that is all uh, pulled by the fact that they decide to implement continuous deployment. Now, when you look at the development teams, they actually do something that kind of looks agile, but they don't really care. They're not doing Scrum by the book or anything like that. So, um, so I would say, first, Etsy proves that uh, just looking for DevOps can pull an organization towards really uh, being faster without the need for Scrum. Second, the result is that you look agile, so you are agile. Um, and third, I still think that they would, they would benefit from Scrum. That is my opinion. <laughs> I think sometimes people um, uh, have troubles uh, comparing agile, what's really, what was agile at the beginning, and what is Scrum, Kanban, anything. And I think if you are doing infrastructure as code, if you are doing uh, DevOps, you are an agile company without having to do any Scrum, any, any methodologies uh, on top of it. You can, of course, it will improve development, but it's not the same thing in the, to be DevOps and to be agile. Even if you can say you are agile, but without any defined methodologies. So I might just uh, actually hijack this conversation very briefly. Uh, I think it's important to, to, to understand that DevOps is not tools, right? DevOps isn't because you have configuration management. DevOps isn't because you're using a particular uh, continuous deployment platform. Uh, the idea behind DevOps is cultural. This gets harped on quite a bit if you come to the DevOps meetups or if you come to, uh, if you read any of the literature on the topic. The idea is that culture uh, manifests as process, and then process manifests or executes as tools. Coming at it from the other way around is a mistake. You can't implement OpenStack and then be, oh, we're DevOps now. It's not how it works. And you can't come into it halfway and be, oh, we're an agile team, or we have a Kanban board now, so now we're DevOps. That's jumping in the middle. It really has to start at a much higher level. It has to start with the idea that everybody can work together and we can start with the idea that management, whatever that means, has a full buy-in on everything that's going to happen afterwards. And I know that sounds sort of hard to say, like, what's going to happen afterwards? How do I do that? Well, these are things we can explore, the th themes we can explore, right? But at the end of the day, when you're, when you're trying to learn about DevOps, you're trying to analyze what DevOps is, it's important to start at the beginning. It's cultural, and that breeds process, and that results in tools. It's top-down. Thank you, Dan, for that, that clarification. So a question that comes up a lot in the DevOps world and DevOps panels like this one is, what actually is DevOps? It, this is what we're talking about now. Um, a few people have, have coined the term CAMS, which is culture, automation, measurement, and sharing. Um, I think we've touched on almost all of these topics uh, this morning. We had a first few talks that were about automation with Ansible and, and partly with Docker. Um, culture was, was definitely the topic of Fabris's, um talk earlier. Um, do, does anyone here have any, any questions, any feedback, any, anything they'd like to share or ask um, the panel here to do with any of these topics? 
culture automation measurement sharing. Sure. Um, I am what we call um, an operator, and uh, I'm currently uh, orienting myself toward development because I think uh, this job uh, will disappear with all these uh, automations uh, means. So what's, uh, what, what is your point of view about that? Thank you. So is operations going to disappear with DevOps? Who'd like to answer that? Um, well, first of all, the interesting question is uh, be behind Amazon Web Services, there must be real life uh, operations. I don't know, you know, I'm not there. Maybe it's a magical world. But I, I guess that um, DevOps has been really helped by the uh, abstraction of uh, um, uh, cloud and, and infrastructure as a service. Uh, and it's true that in most small organizations, I guess the job of doing manual things will disappear because people will start using platforms that abstract all that. But at the end, there must be something physical, a real hard disk behind it, I guess. And I guess somebody still has to change the hard disk and, and, and connect Ethernet cables together and these kind of things. So, um, yeah, it won't disappear. It will suddenly become... Uh, uh, yeah, it will also be, in, in be, it will be different and uh, they will be more centralized. I mean, the, peop the people that do real hardware will be people like Amazon, Google, or maybe Numergy, but less and less uh, small organizations and over actually of course so um my turn to ask a question now <laughs> um we're talking about the role of operations but i actually heard that the theme of several of these talks was it's hard for people to have uh to adapt to change um you guys were saying earlier that you're trying to deploy docker into production but the number one reason you can't is because the operations teams that are running production day-to-day -day basis don't have uh, the knowledge and the experience to work with Docker. Um, Fabrice, you were saying that one of the problems was that the people in this bank you were working for were not aware of how um, they were expected to do things. They were not able to adapt to change very easily. And I think your team had success doing that, but my understanding is that the rest of the organization was not ready to change. It was hard to make this change happen. So um, from having hit this, this, this brick wall, or at least covered this small hill, not to say mountain, but um, this difficulty. Do you have any any anything that any feedback that you could share with us on how to work around this kind of uh, change management situations, basically? I think, uh, at least at Numergy, that's what we experience. But sometimes people in the operation fear to that we will take the jobs, we'll do what they are paid to do. and. The way to um, to bring DevOps to them is just to work with them, to show them that what we are doing, to help them to f um, to work uh, the same way we do. And this way, there's no there's no more operations and developers. There's just one team that do exactly the same thing. Some have more experience in operation, some more experience in development. But in the in the end, we're just a big team uh, that works together. But that's not really where we are right now, but that's where we want to be. Uh, if I take the example of uh, CloudFormation on Amazon, um, there is a fact that as a developer, I can uh, write the template and then work with uh, an operation guy that maintains the template, executes the template, etc., and work on it uh, sometimes. So it's a complementary job. We work on the same uh, uh, base code, if I can say that like that on the same template, the same base, but in fact the um, people uh, have different job on uh, the use of this template. So it's a complementary job. <coughs> my, my answer is, is quite different. No, I believe in the power of alcohol a lot. Uh, <laughs> no, because it's 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 a lot about human interaction, which which is like a, a big discovery for me because I'm I'm quite a uh, I mean, I'm quite engineer-minded, but yeah, all, all the changes we've been Im able to implement are thanks to um, um, human interactions we've managed to create, uh, empathy that we managed to bring in the in the discussion, and and unfortunately, not enough not enough alcohol. So I guess that's why it took so long. 
but uh, yeah, how, how much you, ga you gain from drinking a beer with a, uh, making a dev team drink a beer with an ops team is, is, is huge. It can be coffee in the morning. Yeah. I think it's, a, it's an interesting observation and uh, expand on that uh, very briefly. A lot of what to me is interesting that I've learned in DevOps is very little to do with technology. I've been in the game for 15, 20 years now. So if it's a computer, I've touched it. And that's not what's interesting about DevOps. What's interesting about DevOps is all the soft skills stuff. And as an engineer, that's tough to swallow, right? When I was told, okay, like, we're gonna do this DevOps thing, so that means you're gonna need to go on a management course and learn how to manage. I, mean, I don't wanna manage people, Are you I don't even like other humans. I wanna talk to them, that's why I'm a computer person. <laughs> and in fact, uh, a, lot of, a lot of what's interesting about DevOps is exactly that. It's those soft skills, it's about learning how to listen, it's about learning how to, how to interact. It's about learning how to bring teams together. It's about learning how to share information. And uh, uh, that, that I think is probably the biggest, the biggest element you can bring into any organization. If you're a, a bank or a startup and you wanna do DevOps, is to go, you know, let's forget about the technology. Let's forget about the computers. And let's start listening to one another. Really listening, sitting down, cross-functional teams. Don't even include the managers, just have Everybody sit down together. It doesn't have to be beer, right? I find it helps, but it doesn't have to be. <laughs> Just get everybody sit down together in a room, have a gripe session. Okay, in a perfect world, what would everything look like? Write it down on a board. And then go, you know what? We can do that. We can do that. And that, I think, is, is a really interesting element of it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So do we have any, any questions on, on this topic or, or related topics that we can submit to the panel? Yeah. Semi-related topic? Uh, yeah. Uh, it's about how do you implement the change in a company that doesn't do DevOps. So you, t you talked a lot about that. Uh, there are two approaches I'm considering. One is just grab a team and now you're going to do DevOps and you we're going to go, we're going to do everything right, so source control at every level, deploy, continuous deployment, infrastructure as code, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's cold turkey, basically. And the other option is, so we take a team and we just do little changes and, and we slowly inch towards uh, the desired results. So do you guys have any feedback on either approach? Does one work better than the other? Yeah, I think it's interesting if you have any specific tips, like you were mentioning earlier, um, just write on a whiteboard what the perfect desired state is. That's that's very useful as well. It's very interesting because um, just to rebound on the innovative dilemma, which is this book I, I showed, uh, which says that if the client is actually asking for it, then you can do amazing uh, uh, innovation inside a large organization. So. So the first point I would say is make your client, and usually your marketing, whatever, want uh, quick changes. Um, that is not this is not so obvious. Some people don't want. Some people are so in marketing are so scared that you will break things that they prefer to like not change things. Okay, so once you've solved that problem, they want actually you to change things fast. Um, then we try the two approaches, which is quite fun. We try the approach, yeah, this is the amount of things that we want to prepare before starting to code. It's going to take us two weeks, and then we'll have like the amazing, whatever, super Travis, uh, pan flow, etc. Of course, what happened is that the marketing was completely pissed off for not having anything for two weeks. Um, so we tried to make it faster and faster, reduce it to, you know, you know to make so many, so many things that it took, or if, uh, have, so, yeah, something more like uh, one day or two days. But still, then we realized the other way around, which is was just invest, let's say, half a day a week in improving to the ideal process we wanted was uh, much better. So that's how we're doing it now. Uh, I guess this is perhaps some of my North American bias coming through here. But uh, what I can tell you is, as I said before, it is top down. And if you can't get your management on board, and there's a million ways to, to, to do that, if you can't get your management on board, the solution is to quit and find a new job. <laughs> you know, at the end of the day. Uh, you, can't be, you can't be a small cog in the machine who wants to do this and then be a rogue agent and do it on your own 
Well, you could, that'll get you fired, and then you'll go find a new job. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, I would, say, I would say secret number one. Secret number one is getting buy-in at a high level. It may be worth exploring ways to do that. <laughs> but that's secret number one. Yeah. Thank you. Any, any further questions um, related to this topic or possibly on, on Fabrice's talk earlier about a real world case in a big bank? Okay, no questions for now. I have a few questions for you. Um, so I actually almost got in trouble organizing this uh, DevOps panel here today because this, as you may or, not know, may or may not know, is the code part of the Open World Forum. Um, so I had a bit of a debate with the organizers and they said, well, code track should be about code. We should be looking at lines of code. I said, okay, well, um, why do we have a DevOps track then? Because DevOps is about not looking at lines of code. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of confused. And we got in a small debate, um, which I think was a constructive debate. Um, and I think it worked because we're here, right? And we're talking about culture, we're talking about sharing, we're talking about driving change. Um, and a little bit about code as well, because cause code is part of that as well. Um, so just to bring us slightly back to the this topic of Open World Forum, which is, as you know, a forum about open source. Um, I'd like to ask the, the panel here if, um, you can see and draw any relations, any parallels between the world of open source and converting or adopting open source and the world of DevOps and converting and adopting DevOps. Um, I don't mean necessarily as an individual, maybe as an organization. Um, we all know that open source isn't just about writing a few lines of code and putting up on GitHub. That is technically open source, but it is not a free software project by any means. Um, DevOps is the same, like we said earlier, just using Puppet on your production systems does not mean you are suddenly DevOps. Any thoughts on this? I think it all comes back to the quick change that we were talking about. In a uh, real open source project, when you submit uh, something, you are always have a quick feedback. Maybe not a uh, quick uh, bug fix for what you expect, well, for the bug you Ported, but you always have quick feedback. Uh, versions uh, are released very often, usually, and that's the way we want DevOps to be. It's about bringing quick changes to our organization. We have tools behind it, but we want to get faster and faster in the in the marketing place. And I think that's where you can uh, bring open source and DevOps uh, comparison about culture. Yeah. I'm uh, hogging the mic here, I apologize. Uh, so, so I work for a, a small open source company, um, Mozilla. You may have heard of us. We've got a little software project called Firefox. Uh, you should check it out, it's actually not bad. Um, and uh, it's, it's actually surprising, I came on with them a couple of years back, how monolithic uh, Mozilla w uh, was, and in some cases remains on the inside, very siloed, very, the operations do this, and the printer people do this, and the database people do this, and never the twain shall meet. Uh, and, and this was affecting also how we represented ourselves in our own community, is that we had very, very uh, independent teams. Now, I don't mean independent in the good way. I mean literally no support, had nothing to do with the rest of the company, had no contact with other members of the community. And it were effectively uh, open source contributors, which we were relying on as part of our, of our larger goal, that were heavily, heavily siloed, and they weren't even in our own company. This is crazy. So one of the things that uh, a number of us internally did was we went, well, how can we take DevOps, this idea of breaking down silos, this idea of communication, and so on and so forth, and bring that to our community? And one of the ways that we did that was very simple. Let's get our various community members together and talk about what the different projects are. Are there synchronicities? Is there overlap? And then we go, what do you need to do what you want to do better? It's a very open-ended question, right? So I'm going to pretend I'm the manager, and I, instead of managers telling you what to do, that's crazy. I want you to tell me what to do. What can I do to get the heck out of your way and let you do your job, right? And so we treated the community like this. Instead of going, this is what you get, and you have to do it, and we need these deliverables, we go, hold on, let's reverse that. What's interesting to you? What do you want to work on? Let's find a way to, 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 to achieve mutual goals. And then as I said, culture, 
breeds process, right? The process there becomes how can we help our community, our open source community, to do a better job? What do they need? And then that breeds the tools. We help them set them up with uh, virtual machines, sponsor hardware uh, for, for people in economically disadvantaged areas, uh, tool chains, internet access, all these sorts of infrastructural things that we can supply that allow them to focus on their core competency, which is churning out code. So I think that's a not bad direct parallel, frankly, between applying the, that sort of DevOps idea to the open source community. Sound bad? Is that okay? Does that work out? Yeah? All right. <laughs> yeah, that sounds, that's very interesting. I'm hoping that we can see maybe a, a new breed of, of literature and maybe a talk uh, on DevOps for open source projects. We talk a lot about DevOps for enterprises, but what about DevOps for open source projects? Um, any thoughts on that from the, the public here? You have one? About DevOps and open source, I think one good example is how OpenStack uh, works. For instance, everything on OpenStack is infrastructure as code. When you contribute uh, something for the CI tool of OpenStack, you contribute code. You are registered as an active technical contributor. And everything is open source. The infrastructure is open source. The deployment process is open source. And they really bring DevOps, uh, development, and open source together. So I invite you to have a look at it, and uh, you will see you can do you can change the production environment of OpenStack if you want, if it's accepted. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting because the uh, OpenStack is a DevOps project. I've talked to um, the one of the hosting guys behind Drupal, and it's really interesting to see Drupal as a development community. So on the hosting side, it's horrible. <laughs> it's uh, it's it's a few it's a few people and if they die I, th I guess the all access is uh, disappears forever and yeah they have a lot of, they have a lot of to improve because they're a community of developers and and uh, operations have always been the the last thing they cared about which is quite quite interesting but there's also the the problem of since at some point you need to segregate production from the whole community how do you do that in a more open way I think it's a, it's not such an easy question. There's a word that's come up a few times um, in this discussion, and it came up many times at the uh, DevOps Days uh, fifth year anniversary event in, in Ghent, Belgium, earlier this week, which is empathy. Um, some people actually went so far as to say that DevOps is empathy. It's, that is the definition thereof. Um, obviously, there's, there's many parts in, in DevOps, but I think what we're saying here is very interesting, and you're, you're saying we should empathize, we should put ourselves in the position of those people who are working on my open source project, what do you want? And it's the same in a company, right? What do you want to be able to do your job? What do you want as a company um, to achieve? How do you think that people will feel about the processes um, and the tools they're using? Um, and I'm going to try empathize with, with, with you here and those who are watching uh, the live feed as well. And I know that a lot of the questions uh, that people ask is, how do I get started? How do I do DevOps? Um, and I'm going to ask you for each one of you for one, just the one, um, simple example of how to get started with DevOps. Do something concrete uh, in your organization uh, or your open source project or your side project, whatever, um, that could benefit from DevOps. Can you give us just one example of something to, to start with? Yeah, I would say you, you could start by trying to uh, deploy, to bring some auto-deployment of your tool. Like if you are currently uh, deploying manually your your tool, you can do it uh, automatically. But the, um, that I mean, it's just working on the tool. The, the first thing you should do is more uh, like uh, communication effort with your ops team. See what you can do together on uh, which thing you can you could improve together, and then uh, work on. Um, Stuff like uh, deployment, auto deployment, and stuff like that. I think one way to bring DevOps is to organize uh, internal conferences, bone bank lunch, hack days, and you bring everyone. You bring developers, you bring operations, you make them work together on, on what they want. And they will share, they will talk, they will drink some beers, and uh, at the end, they will m understand uh, each other's problems. 
and they might take what they learned during these ag days and bring it to the everyday job. Well, what we have also done internally, it's um, uh, we before we had a restriction on a Git repository, like uh, the operation team has there on uh, rights on uh, right uh, for the git repository now we don't have that like uh, i'm a developer i can uh, commit on uh, operation stuff which is around that's uh, a first uh, thing you a uh, first bar you could uh, uh, you could get uh, get rid of so the okay <laughs> depends where you start from but if you start from really far away I agree with you. Um, uh, I say, I'd say use Fabric. <laughs> so for once, I would say use a tool. Uh, just automate your deployment. And I remember an example where somebody at Sagem was telling me, what should I start with? We had this discussion. I talked to him about Fabric. And he automated his whole deployment with Fabric. Then got so excited about it, started telling it, uh, telling about the power of automating to everyone in the team, the devs and the ops. And now he's uh, doing panels on DevOps everywhere, uh, speaking about his experience at Sagem. So start with using Fabric, and then everything will just come. <laughs> so I'm going to take a slightly different tack, because uh, that's what I do. <laughs> I would say uh, probably a really good starting pot starting point, one concrete thing you can do is to take some influential members of your organization, identify who those people are, and they should be very, very easy to find in operations and development and marketing and management and uh, human resources and just those tastemakers within your organization and send them to a DevOps days. Just send them to one, wherever it's going to be. It could be here in Paris, coming up in April, check it out. It could be <laughs> in London, it could be in the States, you could make it a vacation, whatever. Just get a, a core group, cross-functional actors within your organization and send them to a DevOps days. That's a really, really good starting point. And it's, it'll work. It will work, trust me. I've seen it happen. Yeah, I think that's, that's all great advice, um, all four of those ideas. Um, we have a question from the public. Can you speak into the microphone, please? Just a qu uh, quick question. Uh, what do you think about starting by uh, development and test environment instead of focusing on deployment and production? Because you might be, um, uh, from an ops perspective, uh, you might have the answer that don't touch production. This is not for developers. This is not for the kids. <laughs> this is for the real guys. And uh, if you start with uh, automating, but on the development and testing part, it might be easier to get people all together. What do you think about that? Yeah, it's also a very good starting point, and you could work on your uh, workflow for your CI/CD stuff, and then work on the uh, deployment and automate the deployment of your stuff. But do you have something to add? I think we did not mention testing uh, development because for us it's it's a requisite. You, if you develop, you are, you test. So we don't mention this, but uh, yes, you you sh you sure should do that. Um, I will be more negative about this because I've seen so many um, head of tech teams uh, buy uh, consulting missions for automating the testing part. Um, it, it does improve lots of things because it is indeed something really important, but it doesn't really bring it doesn't bring visible value um, uh, as much as uh, making the flow faster would. So I, I think it doesn't it doesn't help evangelize uh, DevOps in the whole organization. It just makes the developer team a little happier, which is already good, but not enough in my opinion. Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, we have one. Yes. Uh, I'd I have a question about uh, incident management. Uh, because uh, let's imagine, so you, you have, the developers are always agree with DevOps. You know, it's great for them. They push into production faster. It's great. Prob the problem I foresee is 
when something breaks in the middle of the night, the sysadmin the sysadmin has to wake up. He fixes the problem, and then the and then he will it just wants to go back to bed. So you uh, you often end up with a problem that's fixed on the production server, and there's no communication back to the development team. So how do you handle that? Uh, keeping in mind that this, it has to be uh, uh, the sysadmin will not want to uh, bother with a very big process of merging back the change into the repository and doing all the tests and stuff before pushing the fix into production. Just want I want to fix this now and go back to bed. So how do you handle this problem? So anyone on incidents production process? Actually, when you are using uh, infrastructure tools such as Ansible or others, they will converge. So when you, if you, for the, for the diagnostics part, uh, you of course you will uh, connect to the mesh to the instances, look what's wrong, fix it. But you will always have to uh, to fix it on the code because the next time you will run your deployment, it will go back to the last version that was not impacted by the manual operation. You say devs love DevOps. It depends what kind of DevOps you do. Uh, if you take the Amazon version, uh, Werner Vogel, the city of Amazon, actually came to Paris and made a talk. It was really interesting. So the Amazon version, they're not a really nice company. It's basically everybody is woken up in the night. Uh, everybody is DevOps, and therefore there's no dev who loves it and ops who hates it. That's, I mean, an extreme version, but at least it works, and that's how they get these amazing... Uh, numbers in terms of uh, f deployment frequencies and yeah more generally well it's, a, it's an interesting question <laughs> what I would say is yes the dev team should be at a second level responsible for handling uh, faults and I would say as a transition measure because if you take a, no, uh, an existing team of devs who are not uh, who don't have a contract that say they have to wake up in the night, at least make them uh, make them a, a on call during the day. And as part of this on call during the day, uh, in the morning, check what happened during the night and do some postmortems with the poor ops guy who got woken up. I can tell you from experience that the moment that you hand the pager to a, a developer and the developer gets woken up at three in the morning, that problem will be solved the next day. And the ops won't get woken up anymore. So, um, I'm having a lot of sharing here, which is good. A lot of sharing. Share your, share your code, share your deployment methods using, using automation, share your pager, um, share your problems, share your... Um, you were just talking um, about sharing uh, the, the, the problems. Um, sorry, I completely forgot what you said. <laughs> Yeah, sharing the the anal analysis of incidents with postmortems. Share the understanding. Make sure that everyone is understanding the problems, understanding the, the challenges, which I think is great. Um, we have time for one last question. Um, if anyone has a question, yes. Yeah. So my question was just uh, going going to complement uh, the one there and, and maybe go to another topic. Uh, looking for the advices from the panelists. Um, so when you do DevOps, you, you are trying to do continuous delivery, and maybe one way to solve the incident because when you do continuous delivery, you also try to have uh, you treat everything as code, so the infrastructure and everything, all deployment procedures even. So you try to actually solve the incident not by having a sysadmin fixing the, the machine, but instead fixing the code that will then deploy and, and fix it uh, afterwards so they can capitalize on that. So my question was um, more on the, uh, th there is something, so I, I work for HP, <coughs> and uh, what we do, I'm very lucky to be in a very DevOpsy project, and uh, what we do is that we also adopted something that is called ChatOps, and the idea of ChatOps is, and I, I don't know if it was talked about during this uh, this thing, but uh, the idea of ChatOps, very simply put, is that you it's a, common conversation between all of the actors, so developers, operations, uh, you know, all of the actors that you're trying to, to bridge together, and, and uh, you augment that conversation, uh, so it's a chat system, with a, a bot that does things. So for example, you can ask the bot uh, to de do deployment, to, uh, uh, to restart systems, to change the routing of your infrastructure. So you actually don't do things directly on the machine, like a sysadmin would do, but you do that by asking the bot, and then everybody knows the what you know what's happening in production because it's been public it's archived on the chat and the bot is doing it instead of people 
which is make it super fun. So my question uh, for you would be, um, do you think that chat ops is, uh, do, have you on Kyoto chat ops, do you practice chat ops? And uh, we do, and we think it's awesome, uh, very nice. But I'm wondering if this is something that is trying growing in the, uh, in the area. Any reactions to chat ops? Sure. You guys chat ups? No? So no. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, we definitely, we've been doing chat ups a little, uh, I don't want to sound hipster about it, but we've been doing chat ups since before it had a name. And uh, basically, since we're a distributed team, literally people around the world in almost every time zone except the ones in the middle of the oceans, uh, the only way to, to work together was to sit basically in an IRC channel and type out everything we're doing. Right, so in your head you're gonna go, oh, I gotta SSH to this machine and fix the problem. So before you do that, you go to your IRC window and go, I'm SSHing into the machine so I can fix the problem. And then this way everybody's got a backlog, this way everybody can see what everybody else is doing even though we're highly distributed, and in this way I can come on eight hours later in my time zone, look back through log and go, oh, this cluster over here exploded but uh, you know, Alice fixed it. And I know how she did it because it was written out. So chat ops is an extension of that, right? It's that idea of collaboration. It's that idea of having a log where everybody is, is indicating what it is that they're working on and, and open, uh, having open channels of communication in that regard. And then adding to that, the, the sort of the killer app of that, as our friend from HP mentioned, is having bots. So a, a bot, uh, this is a little script or a little program that you can send commands to. And it interacts with you in sort of a Markov chain sort of way. And uh, this bot takes actions on your behalf. So these are things you could be doing yourself via whatever mechanism, M collective or issuing salt commands or logging into a machine, et cetera, et cetera. But instead, you're asking the bot to do it. And the subtle difference there is that the other people who are participating in that chat session now have a very real, direct understanding of exactly what you did. Instead of saying something vague like, I logged into a machine and fixed the problem, which is better than nothing, everybody else in the team now knows, oh, exactly what machine, exactly what command, exactly the exit code. And it's built in, it's just part of the process. And that's huge, especially if you work on a distributed team. Huge, essential. Is it DevOps? No, right? Those are tools, but those tools fit the process which comes from the culture. So there you go. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, we're reaching the end of this, this open uh, discussion now. I just wanted to uh, invite all of you here uh, and anyone watching us that this kind of discussion happens very regularly. It's hard to find it. Um, this is a bit of advertising I'm going to be doing now, but it's not for my company, so I don't have any money to gain, just advertising uh, for events. Um, every first Tuesday of the month in Paris, we have the Paris DevOps Meetup. This happens, it's going to happen on Tuesday in Daily Motions offices uh, in central Paris. We try and keep it always very central in Paris. And a group of like-minded people come together. Um, it's usually 30, 40 people. Um, pretty good mixture of devs and ops and, and also non-devs and non-ops managers, other people. Um, discussions do happen in French there. Um, although there's usually some English-speaking people like myself and Dan that are willing to chat in English. Um, we also have pizza and beer, um, so it's pretty cool. Um, we have this kind of discussion there regularly. Please come and join us. Um, the more the merrier, and the more people we are, the more different points of view, the more interesting it is. Um, a lot of the discussions happen in an open space format, so the discussion is very open, it's very informal, and it's a great way to actually get help on a problem that you might have at any given time. Um, similar, but on a much larger scale, in April 2015, we'll be holding DevOps Days Paris, um, back here in Paris, obviously. Uh, <laughs> this is a French version, Parisian version, of a worldwide event called DevOps Days that started five years ago, uh, almost to the date, actually, um, in Ghent, in Belgium, with a group of like-minded people, and has now been repeated over the world. I think there were more than 20 different DevOps Days across the world last year, or this year, 2014, and we're going to have the luck to have a 2015 edition right here in Paris. That will be another English-speaking event, but as you may have realized, people tend to discuss not just in the conferences, but also next to the coffee machine, so that can also happen a little bit in French, if you're not too comfortable. 
Um, just to wrap this session up, I'd like to ask if any of you have a, a final word you'd like to add to this. Apparently we have a question. We have one question. C can you... Um, where are the daily motion offices in Paris? Does anyone... Right, it's on devopsdays.fr, the website for the meetup, um, parisdevops.fr, Paris Paris sorry, parisdevops.fr. All the information is there. Yeah, actually, meetups all over, you know, all over the world. And yep. uh, I, I actually met some people there at DevOps Day, uh, DevOps uh, meetup in Grenoble. So it's just right, there are also there. DevOps meetups in many other towns. I know there's one in Grenoble, there's one in Toulouse, there's many others around. Um, just check it out on meetup. There were two in you. Oh. No, don't say that. <laughs> okay, I'd like to um, thank very much the, the people on the panel and, and those who participated in the audience as well. Um, this has been a great discussion. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.